welcome to the latest podcast in the Digital Mental Health Musings uh, series. And I'd like to welcome today, we're really fortunate to have Professor Nick Titoff from the Department of Psychology at Macquarie University. So Nick probably is very well known in the digital mental health space. He's been involved in the de development and delivery of digital psychological treatments for a number of years now. Um, been involved in more than 90 clinical trials of interventions involving more than 10,000 people across four countries and published in more than 200 peer review papers. So if we've got anybody that's well placed to um, talk to us today about the digital mental health landscape in um, Australia, then it's certainly Nick. So Nick's also executive director of both the Mindspot and Ports Clinic, which many of you may well have heard of. So Mindspot, for those who haven't heard of it, is an Australian national service that provides digital assessment and treatment for adults with anxiety and depression. And Ports delivers digital mental health services to primary care across Western Australia. So together, these clinics employ more than 60 mental health professionals and serve more than a whopping 30,000 people per year. Um, so Nick's research and clinical services have brought in more than 80 million in funding and I'd like to welcome you to our podcast today. Thank you very much for joining us, Nick. Ruth, thank you very much. And thanks very much for the invitation to join you today. So I wonder if we could just start off with a little bit of, uh, about the MindSpot Clinic for those perhaps as well who may have not heard of it. That would be a really nice starting point. Happy to do so, Ruth. Um, so MindSpot is, as, as you indicated in your introduction, a digital mental health service and we provide psychological assessments and treatments for people with depression and anxiety. Now, we launched MindSpot in 2012, and since then, demand for our digital services has, has grown quite considerably. And, and as you've indicated today, we, we now operate two clinics and we, we serve about 30,000 uh, people each year. I guess reflecting on, on the history, as you indicated, um, uh, we have been operating for a, for a number of years now, but our story really goes back to about 2007 when we first started to run clinical trials and, and those trials were amongst the first in the world to explore whether we, we could deliver psychological treatments via the internet. So we have quite a history and, and I guess really MindSpot has grown out of that commitment to quality and evaluation, which we've, we've aimed to continue over time. So in relation to sort of MindSpot and perhaps also a little bit more broadly, um, we know that the digital resources are promoted has been effective for reaching perhaps those harder to reach groups, um, you know, rural remote areas and people who may not traditionally seek that traditional mental health help and support. How does that fit in terms of the registrations that you're seeing within the programs that you deliver at MindSpot? Look, consistently, Ruth, it, it's, it's really replicated that pattern you, you've just described. So I'll give you some numbers. About a third of the people we work with report that they've never accessed care before. And that's despite often people reporting they've had symptoms for years, if not decades. And, and about 40% of people we work with live outside metropolitan areas. A high proportion of people we work with are unemployed. A high proportion of people are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Um, we even have homeless people using MindSpot, although of course they still need to have a reliable telephone or, or internet access. But I think it's also surprising for many people uh, that we have quite a lot of interest and increase in use by older Australians. I, I was speaking to a man in his 80s a couple of weeks ago who, who was just finishing our treatment course for older adults and, and he was sharing how he hadn't previously had psychological treatments before using MindSpot and that he, he wished that we had existed decades earlier. So it, it certainly can reduce barriers. It's interesting as well, I'd just like to pick up, you mentioned before a third of people had never previously sought help. What is it do you think about, about online resources that attracts those people? Well, for a lot of the people we work with, they, they report, I think it's about 70% report they have a GP, but only about half of those people report they have a GP who they're prepared to talk to about their, their mental health concerns. So clearly stigma, concern, shame, 
still play a significant role in stopping a lot of people from accessing support. But you know, when we think about the, the nature of people's busy lives, it's really hard for people to engage with traditional service models insofar as having to take time off work to, to attend uh, a session with a psychologist or a GP or a psychiatrist. Uh, you know, for those people who live in, in major cities, it's not unusual to have to take half a day off work uh, to be able to make the time to, to uh, have their mental health attended. And that's not a criticism of traditional services. It's, it's really more a reflection on what some of the, the barriers are. So for people to be able to access digital mental health services uh, at different times of the day, I'm thinking about shift workers, for example, fly-in, fly-out workers, uh, it, it can be a really convenient model. Yeah. Yeah. You also mentioned as well about the, you know, I think I can't remember the proportion you mentioned, but we're from rural and remote areas who are accessing MindSpot. And often, you know, when we do our work with MPRAC, there's a real sense that there's an issue around connectivity um, online in those places. And I'm thinking, you know, your figures are reflecting that that maybe isn't the case. Look, I think, I think it's really important to, I guess, deep dive a wee bit as well. Uh, there are parts of rural Australia, remote Australia, where, where internet connection is exceptional. Uh, but there are also lots of places where it's uh, frankly appalling um, and there's lots of reasons why that's the case and, and lots of attempts by various governments to try to address that. Uh, so, so I think it's really important to call out that there is a digital divide and that these types of services can reduce barriers but that they're, they're not, a, not a panacea. There's lots of room for improvements both from a technology perspective um, uh, but I think from other perspectives as well, including representation. So although we, we do have good representation from, from lots of groups who otherwise wouldn't access care, uh, it, it's, it's not a panacea, as I say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to kind of raise with you, you know, we've had a, it's been a really weird year, year and a half in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's an article that came out probably just over a year ago that was talking about how this was a, black swan moment that would really indicate a shift in mental health care provision towards online prevention, treatment and care. So we're what now, maybe 14, 15 months down the line. Do you, you know, do you see signs that this is occurring? What, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, look, around that time, and I think subsequent to that, there was certainly a lot of enthusiasm uh, about the, the shift from traditional models of care to remote, virtual, e mental health, however you may want to describe them. And I think that enthusiasm is quite appropriate. And certainly services such as MindSpot uh, saw massive increases in demand. At, at one stage last year, we had almost 800 new consumers a week uh, seeking registration or, or services from us. That's almost double our, our usual numbers. And, and I think since then, if we, if we look around Australia and around the world, things have shifted. And for example, here in Australia, the Australian government uh, announced in the May 2021 federal budget, a commitment to increasing funding to the digital mental health sector to provide more comprehensive online prevention and treatment. And in parallel overseas, particularly in the US, but also increasingly in Europe, we can see that there are are enormous amounts being invested in digital mental health services or so-called digital therapeutics. Now, the amount of private investment runs into the hundreds of millions of, of dollars, if not billions of dollars. But you know, having said that, I, I think if you dig a bit deeper, it's clear that some of the intentions uh, need to translate into outcomes. And, and really, if we're, we're talking about the the development of a sector, then sustainability and sustainable funding in particular uh, is important. And, and for many digital mental health services in Australia, they're still operating on 12 month funding models. And, and really it, it's, it's very hard, if not impossible, to create system change uh, unless you, you can provide sustainable uh, longer term funding. Flipping that a little bit as well. So that's also from the perspective of, you know, encouraging the population to 
have access to reliable evidence-based digital resources. Looking at it from the health practitioner perspective, because obviously here at AMPRAC, we you know, we talk to a lot of practitioners about, well, increasing awareness and also supporting people to use it. But ultimately, it's about sort of behaviour change mm. in, in terms of, of it becoming an integrated part of healthcare. So... I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, we can develop all these services and they're funded long term. What are your thoughts around supporting practitioners who want to incorporate digital mental health into their clinical toolkit, if you like, um, and ways in which they may be able to do that? Big question. Sorry. (laughs) No, it's a great question. And and, it's a question we we deal with um, every day. We have uh, calls quite frequently from health practitioners across the country or, or even from other countries asking about what we do and how we do it and how they might incorporate aspects of what we do into their own practice. And on reflection, I, I think in, in many respects, it, it's relatively straightforward and very similar to what we would do with traditional services. And, and that, that is you need to do, as a health pr- practitioner, you need to do due diligence. Uh, you know, you refer your patients, your clients, to services you have confidence in. And that that confidence may be because of longevity, it may be because of personal relationships, but invariably, you know, you want to refer people to services which provide quality care and which are safe. And and so I think a starting point, this is something we recommend to people who are thinking about using digital mental health services or tools, is obviously get to know them over time. But, but more importantly, be really clear about how the service can help or serve your clients. What is it you want to achieve? What are your clients' needs? Do they need information about mental health? Do they need a psychological assessment or treatment or, or something else? And, and answering those questions will help define the, the types of services to look at. And uh, you know, as a consequence, uh, we encourage practitioners to to learn more about those types of service models. Um, Ring them, speak to them, have a look at their website, uh, and then over time refer people, uh, evaluate the quality of care, get feedback from consumers, of course, um, about what's happened and what their experience has been. Uh, So I I think it's actually one of those processes which takes time uh, and, and really needs to be informed by experience. And I think uh, one of the points you mentioned there is something we talk to people as well quite a lot about is, um, you know, use the use the programs. They're there as a resource for everybody, not just for you to use with the clinicians. Get to know one really well. It keeps coming up in conversations that we're having about sort of integrating digital resources into the training of health practitioners across the board. What are your sort of thoughts around kind of that bottom-up approach to... Um, educating health practitioners from their own experience within their studies? Oh, gosh, I think it, it's, it's a really exciting opportunity to upskill the workforce for the future. Now, the reality is we, well, on the one hand, we talk about digital mental health services and traditional services. But on the other hand, in reality, the distinction between them is somewhat be, becoming more and more blurred. Yeah. We, we all use technology. And at MindSpot, yes, we have specialized technology and we use it in particular ways, but the basic principles remain the same. You engage with consumers, you you conduct uh, an assessment which is designed to help people understand their own mental health and their their condition, their treatment options, and you support them to either access care or or receive treatment through your own service. uh, I think most practitioners would say, well, that's just practical uh, clinical practice. I, I think to answer your question perhaps more directly, there's enormous opportunity and scope for training programs around Australia, uh, be they specialist programs within universities or, or uh, programs run by professional organisations to, to develop orientation, competency-based programs of, of, of education. Uh, to train not only the future generation, but also the existing generation in terms of how to use tools. And I think MPRAC are a great example of an organisation whose leaps ahead in in many parts of the world uh, in terms of doing that. I guess that segues quite nicely as well into what I was wanting to ask you about the MindSpot Academy that's recently launched. 
Um, could you tell us a little bit about the Academy and the vision that you have for it? Look, really happy to do that. In fact, we were speaking to a, a number of groups across the, the country in the last couple of days who, who um, uh, represent training programs at universities. We're very keen to, to, to learn more, to get involved and to be able to send um, interns and students uh, for training. And, and basically the, the vision of the Academy is to really uh, support the development of the, the next generation uh, of mental health practitioners who are technologically comfortable um, and competent and, and safe, and, and then to be able to extend that to the existing workforce. So you know, we launched the Academy about 12 months ago, and we've, we've had quite a number of, of interns, students, provisionally registered, registered, registered psychologists, registrars as well come through. Uh, and and the, the, the model basically is to look at the needs of that practitioner to ensure that we help them to understand how to use technology effectively and safely. They practice that, they develop mastery with good supervision, and they, they over time develop the, the confidence that regardless of which role they have subsequently, they know how to use technology and they're not afraid of it, uh, but they can use it safely and wisely. Yeah, yeah I know certainly through MPRAC, we were really excited when we heard about the Academy been launched and it coming out. It feels like this is a real starting point over here of just integrating it and it, it supporting basically people to routinely integrate it into practice. So yeah, we're really looking forward to seeing how that kind of evolves in the future. Um, I just want to hop back a minute because I mentioned in your intro about the Ports Clinic that's running over in Western Australia, I believe. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit more from you about what that looks like, given that it has been integrated into the primary healthcare sector over there. Could you talk us through that a little bit? Sure. We launched Ports in 2017, and it's, it's uh, funded by the three PHNs here in WA, uh, uh, collectively known as the West Australian Primary Health Network or, or uh, Primary Health Alliance, a bigger part of WAFA. Um, and it, it's, as you say, integrated in the primary care. It, it's, it's based on the same architecture that we use to develop Mindspot, but modified and delivered here in WA. In fact, I moved to Perth uh, in early 2020 to help establish a, a clinic in, in Perth, and we quietly launched the clinic uh, mid-2020 uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, the demand for the, the service, like Mindspot, has grown considerably. And it's an interesting model because, of course, we, we recognise that, that digital services provide assessment or treatment services. But a big part of, I think, the success of any service model is to recognise the the requirements of the local communities. And, and so Ports has models of referrals, pathways, which have been specifically developed. Uh, so we have very strong relationships with providers across the states. Um, uh, we have uh, very clearly defined referral pathways, escalation uh, systems to sit alongside existing services. Um, and as I say, it's a service which is just, just growing uh, over time. So that's been really effective in terms of sort of establishing it via GP clinics, is that correct? Or can other people refer into it? Well, in, in here in Perth uh, Metro, so-called Perth Metro, it's, it accepts referrals directly from general practitioners and increasingly from other health practitioners who are involved in, in some way with mental health. But across the states, outside of uh, Perth, and what, what's described as country WA, it accepts referrals from, from local mental health services. So in those situations or places, the, the GP makes a referral to yeah. a local mental health provider who, if appropriate, then makes a referral through to ports. Now, as that's, that's an example, if you like, of how we have aimed to provide a backup and a support for local services but also modified the service model for the needs of the communities. Yeah. And, and on occasion, um, and, and I think this is an issue and a challenge across uh, regional Australia, some of the, the mental health services across the state 
have had a, occasional difficulties with service continuity. And some of these services are, um, are relatively small and they may lose one or two staff and their ability to meet demand is obviously compromised. And what, what Ports has been able to do on a number of occasions, in fact, we're, we're doing uh, this at the moment in one location, is to provide, if you like, a, a virtual safety net for those services. And so the GPs in those locales will, will receive a service directly from Ports until the local service has built its, its workforce up again. And then we step back. And, and I, I think that's a great example of uh, an outcome and a benefit which frankly, we didn't actually anticipate, yeah. but it, it's a nice way to think about the potential of these virtual services or, or digital services. Yeah. Especially when we know that the challenges in Australia around the mental health workforce, it sounds like it kind of expands and contracts a little bit to support around, around those issues. So, okay, thank you for that. I'm going to um, just jump forward a little bit. There's one of your many papers that you published, there's a recent one that's talking about, uh, it's a really nice practical paper, 10 lessons learned during your time establishing and delivering at ICE Internet Delivered CBT. Um, I guess for people listening, it would be really helpful to give a few practical tips around from your experience. If, you know, somebody's listening to this and going, yeah, I would really quite like to sort of incorporate this maybe into into my private practice or our clinic, wherever it might be. What are the key lessons for practitioners that you'd suggest that come out of this paper? Gosh, lots of lots of lessons, Ruth. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh, I've got to say, we learned the hard way, um, uh, and and you know, I need to acknowledge some of the other authors on on the paper. We had authors from uh, Sweden, from Canada, uh, the US, and you know, really, we were we were pulling our experiences. And, and really reflecting on all the things we wished we hadn't done <laughs> or we, we learned, as I, as I mentioned, the hard way. But I, th I think one of the, the key standout messages was as a practitioner, we, we often, as we all know, don't necessarily recognise our blind spots or our biases. And, and what I mean by that is we, we're all trained, we were all trained in the face-to-face -face modality. And, and that carries with it a whole series of assumptions and, and um, implications and beliefs. It beliefs that it's important to see a person face to face, beliefs that, that we need to have a minimum number of sessions in order to be able to in engender psychological change or shift in the consumer. And, and of course, the digital environment challenges all of those assumptions. And, and across the, the world, as, as we've spoken with other service providers would recognize that those are all underlying assumptions and beliefs which we've, we've had to challenge because it, often they're incorrect. Um, consumers don't need to see me face to face. They don't need to have contact with me every week. What they need to have is a strong relationship with the, the intervention, with the model. They have to believe in it. Uh, it has to, to speak to them, meet their needs, be valuable. And, and my role as a therapist uh, will differ depending on the, the needs of the, that client. Some people will benefit from a lot of support. It may be two sessions a week. Other people will dip in and out of models of support and engage with me when, when they need to, whereas other people just really need information or um, access to good, simply presented information and that they, they really just want to help themselves. So there have been some, some lessons of, uh, around that. But I think overall, our experience has been that it's on the one hand challenging because invariably you're learning about technical skills and modifying your model of practice. But on the other hand, it's enormously satisfying and stimulating. Uh, speaking to a, a number of our interns recently, they, they were, and these are people who are, um, are currently enrolled in the academy they were talking about how they could never believe they could work with 20 or 30 people simultaneously across Australia from different walks of life, different ages, different presenting challenges or problems. But as therapists, as, as relatively junior mental health professionals, they, they found it enormously uh, challenging on the one hand, but incredibly stimulating 
and rewarding on the other hand, particularly as they, they heard stories about some of these people not otherwise being able to access care and, and still being able to get so much from this model. So I think there's there's lots of lots of um, lessons there for therapists. Yeah, yeah, and I want to pick up on one of those points actually that you um you mentioned early on in, in sort of addressing that question. So you know you mentioned the therapeutic relationship, and I know in my clinical training it was there was a lot of emphasis on that relationship between people, and I think between uh, therapist and patients or clients. And I know we had a conversation I think many years a couple of years ago when we first met. Could you, and that following on from that, a lot of practitioners say to us they're concerned about digital resources because of their, their therapeutic relationship. You know, where does that go? Could you perhaps provide a bit of advice to, to clinicians, health practitioners who see this as a major barrier for them using resources? Look, I, I certainly understand people's concern. And, and of course, having been trained in the face-to-face -face, uh, tradition, uh, and and having it made very clear early on and repeatedly through my training in the early years of practice that therapeutic alliance and relationship was was gold if you like uh, I, I appreciate the importance of that and over the years particularly working in the digital space Ruth we've kind of been forced to again challenge that assumption yeah. but but not to discard it but really probably to deconstruct it and, and I think what we what I what I mean when I talk about therapeutic relationship is uh, a relationship that's built on mutual respect, um, a relationship which helps the client, the consumer, to engage and stay engaged, particularly when treatment is challenging. And if you map that against the the range of digital mental health tools uh, that are available, I, I can certainly see why practitioners uh, are concerned. Um, it is hard to, to build a relationship with a website or an app. Um, but if there's a person behind it or a person you can speak to, then there's a point of contact. And I, I can't speak for other services, but at, at Mindspot, we, we certainly aim to build those relationships. So when someone completes an assessment, uh, we strongly encourage that person to talk to one of our therapists, uh, to talk about their, their needs, their symptoms, uh, to talk about their treatment options. Um, and then if they engage with treatment with us, they, they stay with, that, or with a therapist throughout the eight weeks of treatment, the same therapist. And, and of course, people can then choose how often they want contact, but there is often a really strong relationship that's developed. And you know, we've, we've tested this uh, from a research perspective. And we, we know that the, the level of therapeutic engagement that people have and the level of therapeutic relationship they develop with, so I can only speak about our treatments, but with our treatments is the same as, as what we see benchmarked in the literature from face-to-face -face care. And I think that that's, that's important because we, again, can sometimes assume people will only build a relationship with a person. But I think most people I know have, have developed relationships with systems and processes where they feel supported, uh, feel valued, feel respected. Um, and that's certainly something which I, I think is, is critical and um, uh, will probably continue to, to be so. Any thoughts, Nick, around, you know, there's um, sort of instruments in, uh, evolving and emerging around feedback-informed therapy for the online space now. So a little bit like the session rating scale that you might do face-to-face -face or something similar. Do you see utility in using those in terms of you know communicating with a person you're or opening that dialogue and using it as a structure for for basically an open conversation around how how do you think we're going how do you see this sort of relationship it's a great question we, we actually uh did that for i think the first five years of operations uh, so at the end of every session, we invited people to uh, rate the session, rate the therapist, and provide any feedback, uh, comments, um, including comments about things which they didn't understand or wanted to follow up uh, about. And um, it, was, it was certainly valuable, but it was actually only valuable for people who, who wanted to share that feedback. Yeah. And those people who wanted to share that feedback were people who were engaged anyway. Um, now, that's not to say that, that it's not something we 
we, I don't think, um, should be done. I think it's a great idea. Um, and in fact, we've had discussions in the last few weeks about reintroducing that. Um, uh, so I, th I think there's enormous merit in it, but I, I'm always cautious about the, the fundamental question about whether this will help and to be open to, to potentially a challenge to that as well. Good food for thought, because I think maybe there's a tendency, especially with the standardised instruments, to kind of churn them out, you know, and not necessarily think about, okay, what is this actually about and how are we using the data? So, yeah. I am mindful we're getting a little bit short on time and you're um, extremely busy. So maybe we could sum up if it's easy enough to do in your top tips if you like, or top three tips for people listening to this uh, podcast who really don't know where to start. And I know you've already mentioned a few early on around various aspects. What are the top three for someone who's like, yep, I'm inspired, what do I do? Okay, uh, look, probably building on what I mentioned before, but taking perhaps a starting point, which is a bit of a segue, and that is recognize the hype. There's enormous hype. And, and although I'm in the middle of it, every few weeks, someone sends me a paper about the latest um, artificial intelligence this or the latest app that or service that. Um, and the reality is a fair bit of it is hype. Yeah. And I think as practitioners, just go back to first principles. What is it we're trying to achieve? And, and being really clear about well, what, why would you use a tool or why would your clients need a tool? What would you hope to achieve? On the basis of that information, that'll help, as I mentioned before, to identify the kind of service you're looking for. It might be a relaxation app. It might be a service like MindSpot. It might be a, a website with information or a, a helpline that someone could call. Find two or three of those. Do your due diligence. Uh, contact them. Um, uh, have a chat to them and, and find out. Uh, what makes them tick? Would you trust them? Would you refer family and friends? Because that's actually the criteria we use at MindSpot. Um, firstly, would we build? are we building a service which we would want to refer family and friends to? And if we refer someone somewhere or, if, or suggest something, would we refer our own family and friends to that? Now, now, that doesn't replace clinical due diligence or governance, but it's a pretty sensible kind of just check in the background. Um, and once you've, you've identified it, try it um, uh, and evaluate it um, and over time build that repertoire. Um, but they'll, they'll give you a sense of confidence, a uh, starting point that's, that's realistic and which you can build on uh, over time, acknowledging the space is evolving rapidly. Um, uh, and, but we are, we are all going to use these tools, I think, increasingly as time goes by. Some really cool tips there. So I think obviously tailor it, consider what you want to get out of it and your client or patient wants to get out of it. Do due diligence and start small. I think I'm also hearing as well, very much. Absolutely. So, um, so we're probably getting short on time now, unless there's anything that you think we need to put out on this podcast. Um, that's it for my questions. Ruth, look, my, my um, uh, I guess my closing remarks really are about thanking you for the opportunity um, uh, and congratulating the MPRAC on all, all the achievements and all the great work that you're doing and um, uh, happy to take any questions at, at any point people can contact me and uh, happy to, to, to chat. That's fantastic. Thank you, Nick. And I'll also put up the links for those uh, listening to MindSpot and also the MindSpot Academy and anything else that's come up today so people can access that easily. So... Thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge around this area with us, Nick. It's very much appreciated. Pleasure, Ruth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.